Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. And on today's episode, we're doing a continuation of this really fun series about retirement income planning. So again, I'm joined by Devin. And today we have a, a good friend of ours, actually Devin and I both interacted with a number of times, Christine Benz, who, you know, might be uh, at least online, right? You're, you're like the person when it comes to some of these topics we're going to talk about. So it's fun to have you here. Uh, and we're in Chicago too, which is a fun place to, to have you uh, on the show. So Christine, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jamie. And it's my hometown, by the way, Chicago. So you made it very convenient for me to be here. It's great to see both of you. Well, we did an interview before this, and uh, we're shooting a couple here today, but we were talking about food and how great of a food town Chicago is. I know you love food, too. You've been on the show once before. Um, but what's your favorite thing about Chicago food? I'm just going to limit it here, being that we already framed up Chicago once. Oh, gosh. Well, it's hard not to say you know, pizza. I think the pizza here is great. And what I don't get is like these pizza partisans who are like, oh, all New York, Chicago pizza is bad, whatever. All pizza is good. It's delicious. So I would say that's probably my favorite. I mean, everybody probably says pizza, but uh, we have some I think awesome pizza here from the big chains like Lou Malnati's to the more kind of mm-hmm. micro chains. Well, it, it, I, I do go to Omaha a lot. And what I'll tell you is all pizza is not good pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they have heard this from me in Omaha. And I, I keep thinking about it. It's like somebody just needs to take a good pizza place from elsewhere and come to Omaha and you'll do very well because they like pizza there or what they think is pizza. And it's barely describable as pizza. So, uh, the, you're also going to Italy too. So yeah. what are you excited about food in Italy? Cause Italy is a beautiful, it's one of my like dream. I want to go to Italy and just like make pasta for two weeks and then come back. But, uh, yeah, that's a good plan. Um, well, we're going to be in Rome for part of our trip and, uh, we have a favorite restaurant in Rome called Antico Arco. So we have our reservation there already. Um, we once saw Morley Safer in Antico mm-hmm. Arco, the CBS, 60 Minutes correspondent and my husband, I think he went out to take a phone call and he came back. He was like, I think Morley Safer's in the bar. And then he's like, I'm just going to Google Morley Safer still alive. <laughs> and indeed, it was Morley Safer. He loved Rome and loved this particular restaurant. So um, that place is kind of a nouvelle sort of uh, spin on Roman cuisine. And then um, we'll go elsewhere. We think either Sardinia or um, Umbria. So, yeah, going to be a good trip. Awesome. Well, uh, like Jamie said, you're kind of a rock star in the retirement income space. Um, how did you get into the, this type of topic and, and why? And what's what's the why behind it? Why are you so interested and passionate about retirement income? Well, really, the genesis for me being interested in this area was my father-in-law. Um, he was one of these income-centric investors. And I remember him telling me one day that he was going to buy, I can't remember if it was GM or Ford bonds, and it had whatever yield he was looking for. And I knew that he wasn't holding it alongside a hundred other bonds. And I was thinking, okay, what can we do to help simplify this for people so that they can build a diversified portfolio that delivers them the cash flow Mm -hmm. that they need to live on? And they're not disproportionately anchoring on current income as he was. And so that I would say uh, kind of crystallized for me the importance of helping people take an investment portfolio and figure out how to extract cash flow from it so that they're not disproportionately focusing on income and building a really sort of strange looking undiversified portfolio in the process. So I do remember that was the key thing. And then from there, you know, the more I learned about retirement income, the more I realized that accumulation is a walk in the park compared to decumulation. You know, as long as you in invest regularly and invest in some semi-sane way, given your time horizon, you'd probably be okay. But there are all kinds of crazy things people can do when it comes to generating cash flow from their portfolio. So that I would say is what keeps me interested because I think there still is a huge need. Do you remember that? Did you see the bond certificate too? Because a lot of people, right? Like we still have a bunch at our house now too, or we did. I guess we, they have been moved since. But um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people even know that there are real bond certificates. But did you do you remember the one then? I don't. And he did have a financial advisor who was helping him, so it's possible that the advisor kept the bond certificates. But I did uh, have an aunt who I think subsisted exclusively off of her municipal mm-hmm. bond coupons and clip literally, yeah, physically 
actually clipping the coupons was part of the job of, of getting her income. So we've come a long way since those days. Yeah. Th those certificates were pieces of art and, and a lot of people will buy them on oh. eBay and frame mm -hmm. them and put them up on their house. It's uh, I mean, they're just beautiful pieces beyond the function of the of clipping coupon, uh, coupons. Stock certificates are, are that way too. Stock certificates for sure. Yeah, there was the movie, um, what was it called, Safe Room? And like, that's what, like in that safe room, they break into the house, right? And they're trying to steal and there, there are these certificates. I don't remember if there were stock or bond certificates in there. And at the end, it's, I think it's Forrest Whitaker and they, they go, they all blow away kind of in this rainstorm My at the gosh. end. And uh, yeah, it's like, it's kind of one of those really interesting, like at the time, literally had no idea. It's not the point of the movie, right? Like the movie is a safe room and all this tension and then right breaking into the house. But like in hindsight, I realized like, oh man, like that's, <laughs> it's like kind of a financial advisor story about like why not to keep all of our stuff in a safe room and floor of a house right <laughs> and, and i think those were bearer bonds too and, and bearer bonds don't really exist anymore but uh yeah i think that's if i remember that movie correctly yeah well uh christine let's uh, shift over and talk about retirement income and the philosophies that are out there so you've written on this before uh for morningstar which is like there's all these different philosophies but if you were to break them down into maybe some categories that people follow in retirement income how do you describe those what are the main ones that come to your head well i think the main strategy that is associated with me is the bucket mm -hmm. approach to retirement portfolio planning and i always credit harold Avensky as kind of being the person who put the bug in my ear about bucketing but the basic way that I think about it is that you have a cash bucket that is there to supply your living expenses in, on an ongoing basis and uh, that I think allows you to make peace with the long-term portfolio which will have some volatility along the way but knowing that you have that cash bucket and it's not going to jeopardize your ability to take a cruise with your family or continue to go out to dinner on Saturday night with your friends whatever constitutes your quality of life I think that having that cash set aside, I think can make sense. So that's the bucket strategy. I think it's intuitively appealing. I talk to a lot of individual investor audiences and I kind of see the light bulb go off with them and have heard from many individual investors who have said that it has worked exactly as intended for them, that it, it has supplied them with peace of mind and allowed them to go about their business in a year like 2022, mm -hmm. where you've got both the bond piece and the stock piece experiencing volatility. So um, that's one strategy. Another strategy, and by the way, I, I don't think of these as mutually exclusive. I think they can work together. But flooring is another strategy that I know that uh, you, Jamie, have worked on extensively. But the idea is that you are building a uh, uh, stream of cash flow from Social Security, perhaps a pension, perhaps an annuity, and that allows you to, uh, again, tolerate the volatility that will accompany your long-term mm -hmm. portfolio, knowing that your basic needs are met through those non-portfolio income sources. So that's another um, system. And then systematic withdrawals, a lot of people I'm sure listening would be familiar with the 4% guideline, but the basic idea is saying, I'm going to take X percent of my portfolio per year, perhaps inflation adjusts that dollar amount along the way. And then I will, on an annual basis, look at whatever looks ripe for the picking in terms of what will supply those cash flows. So, I mean, here's where I think that the systems can work together where someone, if they're using a bucket system, they need to also have a sensible amount that they're taking out from that portfolio every year. So I think that the things work hand in hand. And similarly, I would say that with flooring, step one of the bucket approach is figure out how much you need per year roughly, and then figure out how you can get these non-portfolio income sources to to go as high as they possibly can be, so you're not having to worry about your discretionary withdrawals. I think that can allow people to be much more flexible in terms of their actual withdrawals from the investment portfolio if they've laid that baseline of cash flows from non-portfolio income sources. Well, can we fist bump? <laughs> and the reason was that you didn't call it the 4% rule, right? And uh, what did I call the guideline? Guideline, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was great. I've educated myself on this. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm sure that I used to call it the 4% rule at some point too. And I, I've become very opposed to that language. And even that Wall Street Journal article recently was like the creator of the 4% rule. And I was like, 
I have a problem with all of those things, right? Like Newton didn't create gravity, right? We find these <laughs> things. It's a finding. It's a guideline, right? Whatever it might be. It's not a rule, right? Like rules, right? Put structure. It was just a finding that worked in a particular scenario to, during a particular period of time, right? And so uh, there's a little meme of me holding up a piece of paper that says it is not a rule. And uh, <laughs> I love that, actually. I, I love that video segment. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. You've seen it too. <laughs> I did see it. I yeah. thought it was great. Um, but those are, you know, we all just get better at those things. You know, I, there's certain language things I feel like I've gotten better on. That one is one. Um, and I used to do the same thing. I used to treat all of those philosophies, and I'd say there's even more than those too, um, you know, but I used to treat them as like separate. Mm -hmm. And what I started to figure out is like, actually, they all kind of work together. They're just different ways to frame concepts. But in one retiree's situation, you might be using elements of all of them That's so right. kind of the follow-up question is what elements do you like from those different strategies and what do you think are some drawbacks to them too yeah so starting with bucketing i think behaviorally it works by helping someone be at peace with their long-term portfolio's volatility um in terms of a disadvantage, it's not going to protect you if you're taking too much from a bucket portfolio. And the other thing is that that cash is dead money, especially in a higher inflation environment like we find ourselves in today. The cash is um, you know, going to be sort of a negative return source for you. So I've talked to Wade Fow extensively about this, and he argues that people should do everything that they can do if they're using a bucket strategy to try to reduce mm -hmm. the drag of the cash on the portfolio. So that's a, a big negative. Um, in terms of flooring, I think the key benefit of having your income sources supply as much of your cash flows as possible a big one is cognitive decline. I think we know that older adults, well, for sure, experience higher rates of cognitive decline, especially as you age throughout your retirement, you are likely to encounter cognitive decline or at least have a greater susceptibility to it. So I like that paycheck equivalent. Mm -hmm. It seems like whatever people can do to set themselves up to have as much of their cash flow delivered through a paycheck, uh, like uh, a those flooring elements, I think that that's hugely advantageous. Um, in terms of the drawbacks, especially relate, related to annuities today, the big one is obtaining inflation protection hmm. while also having uh, a, a stream of income from an annuity. It seems like the, those products, anything with a fixed rate of income as attached to it is really vulnerable in inflationary environment. Um, and then in terms of the 4% guideline, <laughs> I would say um, a key advantage is that that 4% is a decent starting point. I often think about some research that Fidelity did a few years ago where they surveyed pre-retirees about how much they thought they could take out of their portfolio sustainably. 10%, I think. There was a heavy mm -hmm. percentage of the survey respondents who thought 10% was viable. So we need something to help guide what is a decent amount to take out of their portfolios. I think the big downside of sort of that fixed real withdrawal system, especially um, given what we know about retiree spending is that retirees just don't spend that way, that most retirees are indeed pretty variable in terms of what they take out from their portfolios, that their own spending changes over their life cycles. And so that sort of static real withdrawal system doesn't incorporate those spending um, changes. So just a quick spin through the what I perceive as kind of the pros and cons of those different Christine, systems. you mentioned the behavioral elements yeah. of bucketing, and it's a form of mental accounting, it is. right? And the, and the textbook always kind of frames mental accounting in a negative way, it, but, but here you're actually using it in a positive way. So tell me a little bit more about the behavioral elements and in, in using that bias in our favor instead of uh, against us usually. Yeah, it, you're, you're so right. I'm, in fact, I remember when I first was discussing this whole bucketing system with some of my colleagues who are more sort of in the academic research realm, they were saying, but, 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 but it's a form of men mental accounting. And, you know, when I think of sort of negative mental accounting, I, I think of my own approach to my aunt, to my monthly spending in my household, which is that we put everything on our credit card until I'm like, oh, I don't like to spend much more than X dollars. And I won't say what it is. On the, for whatever <laughs> reason, it just feels bad. So then I'll start just using my debit card or writing checks or whatever right. for the 
overage. And that makes no sense whatsoever. Unhealthy mental accounting. Don't do that. But I do think that bucketing is a healthy form of mental accounting in that if people know that they have their cash flow needs set aside, that they can be at peace with their long-term portfolio. Um, you know, similarly, I've been really excited to hear about helping people with emergency funding in the accumulation years, like these, I think they're called like sidecar funds that would live inside your 401k where you would have this savings vehicle. That can help people, I think, set aside funds, even if it might not be tax advantage, to cover their emergency expenses. Healthy mental accounting. And I think the bucket approach is similar. And it just strikes me as an advisor, that's an area that an advisor can add a ton of value, right? Kind of help the clients understand the accounting of, uh, of the different buckets and strategies and approaches, Jamie, right? To a large extent, I viewed bucketing and mental accounting as storytelling techniques. And often when people hear me say that, I think people are like, oh, well, you're not doing real work. You're just talking about storytelling. And I'm like, well, the only way we passed down information for 3,000 years was by telling stories. So there's actually a very good use to storytelling. And you know what I mean by storytelling, though, is it's a communication tool, right? It's a way to explain concepts to people that are otherwise difficult to remember. There's this really cool thing yet. I was uh, actually, it was a legal CE presentation, best legal CE uh, I've ever done. And uh, the guy was up there and he actually used to work in Hollywood and he wrote stories and scripts. And then he started working with attorneys, almost exclusively working on their opening and closing statements. And what he realized was everybody was doing it wrong. What they were doing was going in and saying, you know, that person's an alcoholic they're clearly an alcoholic, didn't you see they're an alcoholic? And that was their thing, right? They would just tell you what they wanted you to come away with over and over again. And he goes, actually, the way that you do it is you don't ever say it. He goes, you come in and you say, you know, Joe, he would get off work at 4.30 and by 4.35, he was at his local bar and his drink would already be poured for him. And the second one would come before he was done with the, you know, the first one. And he goes, and everybody in there knew his name. And he goes, that's that's who we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and then everyone else decided who they were. And then there was no way to convince them otherwise. And he goes, and everybody was always trying to tell people, but once we decide by ourselves, it's very hard to change our mind. And it was this really amazing thing. And then he had everybody do that in small groups. And he goes, tell somebody 10 facts about your high school. And then you try to repeat those 10 facts. You'd remember like two to three of them. And he goes, now tell a story that included all those same 10 facts. And almost everybody could repeat the same story. So if I was just like the Dons, Blue, Gold, Baltimore, right? You'd remember very few of it. But if I told you the story about going to school there, you could piece them all together. And I think that's what bucketing really allows advisors to do is piece together the story so clients then buy into it. Um, could you actually just, uh, so that was a long time of me talking. So, um, <laughs> but for people who are unaware of what mental accounting is, could you talk a little bit about like, what's the research behind it, right? Like where we treat money differently based on where it's from, those types of things. Right, so I think my example of how I sort of think about our monthly spending is a good example of that like same money we're going to pay our credit card bill regardless of you know uh, of how much it is mm -hmm. or whatever um, and you know the money coming directly out of our checking account it's all the same mm -hmm. money but for whatever reason it helps me kind of think about things it helps me um, feel less stressed about money to do things in that way so I think that that's an example about mental accounting, sort of different buckets, different categories for money when, when at the end of the day, the, uh, the types of money are sort of fungible. Yeah. And there's this, um, there was research, I think it was done around this, which showed people like lottery winnings versus their earnings and how they spent those, they spent them differently, right? Found sure. money versus earned. And I always use like the pizza or like swear jar example to people, right? Like a lot of people have this cash that's sitting in their home somewhere that they only use for certain things. Like you wouldn't use it for everything. And as you're saying, like, it doesn't make any sense. Like it's all a dollar, no matter where it's sitting, but we'll use it differently. So when you get to retirement and you try to like 
put that into practice what how do you how do you see the structuring of that in a retirement income plan right because it's one to say hey you're going to describe this but how do we actually apply that to a person's situation yeah the basic idea is that i think about it as structuring the portfolio based on my anticipated cash flow demands from it so you know the starting point is you're thinking about what your cash flow needs are then you're looking at flooring them by maximizing your income from your social security pension, whatever, your non-portfolio income sources, annuities. And then from there, I've got some number that I will be spending from my portfolio annually. And the way I like to think about it is I use the probabilities of having a positive return from an asset class to inform how I invest for that spending horizon, if that makes sense. So, you know, especially given where we are today with rising interest rates, buffeting around bond prices, for one to two years worth of cash flow needs, really the only place where you can keep that money safe, sort of setting aside inflation considerations, is in cash investments. So like one to two years worth of portfolio withdrawals in cash investments, then stepping out on the risk spectrum from there. So we know that over say three to five year time horizon. So if your holding period is at least three to five years, you're probably just fine in short term bonds. That even if the downdraft due to interest rates can, continues, that you'll probably be fine with short duration bonds. So you might hold those for the next, um, say, three to five years of retirement. And then intermediate term bonds for the period beyond that. And, and high quality bonds is kind of what I'm talking about here. Because we know that if you have, say, a five to 10 year time horizon, looking at market history, looking at rolling returns over a variety of interest rate regimes, we know that you'll probably be made whole at the end of that period if you have a time time horizon for holding those bonds of at least five to 10 years. And then for money uh, for years 10 and beyond, that is where I would hold the growth assets in my portfolio. So I would hold stocks there. I would hold um, junkier bonds, emerging markets bonds. I would hold to the extent that I had commodities or precious metals in my portfolio. I'd give them a lot of room to jump around because I know that I won't have to invade them in a downturn. And that's really the name of the game, that you're setting up this portfolio so you're never having to tap your cash flow sources when they're in a, in a trough. So that's kind of the basic framework that I think about. And, you know, the interesting thing is when you take real people's cash flow needs and overlay it on this bucket approach, a lot of times you end up with a fairly conventional looking sort of 60-40 or 50-50 portfolio. But I think it's kind of a way to understand understand why the portfolio is structured as you've done it. I love the word you just used, the real people, right? <laughs> because, you know, if you have an investment background like myself, you know, we're always constructing these portfolios mathematically optimized and mean variance optimized and so forth. It doesn't really take into account the rational, you know, the irrational person and the real person who has priorities and, you know, maybe needs permission to, uh, you know, to, to take on risk in some areas if they feel like some of their you know, essential needs have been taken care of, and you can't really capture that in a portfolio. So the, the the segmenting and the bucketing kind of capture those those hard to describe por uh, elements of a portfolio. Uh, yeah, that, and that's really valuable. Devin, that's one thing I often say when I speak to advisor groups is, I don't care if you're not using the bucket approach to set up client portfolios, but I do think it's a really great illustration tool to explain, well, here's roughly why I have this portfolio organized in this way. And I think most most advisors would find that that topic or that idea of using time horizon to organize the portfolio would say, yeah, that kind of makes sense given how I approach it. The mention of two things in there, I really like the term, so we're going to play on them for a section, which is the um, junkier bonds. I love that one. <laughs> and it's a, it brings up a really interesting thing in my head is like, you know, junk bonds is a term we use out there. You really should we be using that term as an industry? Like, I, I guess, because when I think about that, it really implies like we sh you shouldn't be using them. Those are junk, right? But we do use them in some cases. So I guess that's the first one I'll ask you about then, Devin. I'll make sure I go back on the other one about irrational. Back to you. Yeah, so um, you're right. I mean, the alternative is high yield 
bonds. And that is a broad basket that encompasses, you know, I guess sort of in a traditional sense, high yield bonds would be anything rated below what triple B. Um, but it's a basket that encompasses, you know, U.S. corporates. I'd throw emerging markets bonds in there, mm -hmm. floating rate or fixed uh, or bank loan investments. It, I think of it as kind of a broad uh, basket of, of junkier, lower, yeah. lower quality bonds. And by the way, I think they've proved their merit uh, <laughs> because what we've seen is kind of this bifurcation where high quality yeah. has, has been hit pretty hard in 2022 and lower quality hasn't done great, but it has held up better than high quality. So I think there's a role for those fixed income types. But I always think, you know, think of them as kind of the aggressive kicker for mm -hmm. your fixed income portfolio. They're not, they should not supplant high quality bonds. And then, Davin, I might come back to you on this one, too, which is the irrational. And I, I, I love that because, um, you know, I, I started adding this to one of my presentations, which is a lot of the stuff we describe as irrational isn't actually irrational, right? Because like, we kind of misuse that term. I always say, like, if somebody is like, hey, I want a tuna fish and peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we'd be like, this, that is not a rational human <laughs> being right there. But that's not the definition of rationality, right? Like if they always order a peanut butter and jelly and tuna fish sandwich every time they go to a place that will serve them that, that's, that is actually rational decision making, right? They make a consistent and coherent set of decisions based on the information provided. Yeah, but, I, I mean irrational in a, in, a, in a sort of a clinical, very specific mm -hmm. definition, right? So modern portfolio theory, you know, going back to Harry <laughs> Mockeritz in the 50s, you know, when he created this mean variance optimized model he said this is only for people who have a certain set of characteristics right mm -hmm. they know everything all the information that's knowable they should react in a in a, a maximizing ut utility way and so that's kind of the, the specific definition yeah. of, of irrationality or rationality and but it's you know most people and all people are in some ways rational and other ways not rational and it's a mistake to not build a portfolio for the actual person you're building it for uh, otherwise they wouldn't be able to live with it they're going to be your client that's going to call you at the worst possible time to blow up the portfolio because they can't live with it it wasn't constructed uh, with with their types of rationalities in mind what other heuristics or behavioral finance pieces are you really interested in right now, Christine, as it relates to retirement income planning? Because a lot of them have historically been applied to the accumulation, not the decumulation side. So I find this really interesting, like mental accounting now being applied in a positive way to the decumulation. Is there anything else out there that you're finding really interesting right now? Well, I mean, going back to the 4% guideline, I think, um, you know, it's a form, it's a, it's a rule of thumb that I can think can be really a useful starting point, better than nothing for sure, mm -hmm. better than 10% for sure. So I think that that's a helpful heuristic in the realm of educating clients about well, what are we doing here and why can't you spend more and maybe you can spend more in some years and less in other years but i think it's a sort of good place to start the discussion to explain well yes you have a million dollar portfolio but here's why i think we probably shouldn't start any higher than forty thousand dollars initially so i think it's a good starting point so tell me a little bit about the challenges of that income plan, even with something like a 4% guideline with the current rate environment and where inflation is today. I know you spend a lot of time thinking about those two things. So how are they impacting retirement income planning today? Yeah, well, the starting with interest rates, it's been, you know, just huge in terms of impacting retirees comfort level with bonds today. In fact, I, I think it's like so difficult to convince retirees to make room for bonds. I think that the idea is that they want to, you know, hold cash in lieu of bonds. Um, but I do think that that challenge can largely be solved by educating about um, the time horizon for various bonds that you might hold that if you do have a reasonably long time horizon, given your anticipated spending date that you're probably fine in bonds. There's certainly been a short term price dislocation in, in bonds. But over time, I think, you know, you it's kind of a mental hurdle that you have to climb. But uh, higher yields are good for investors. In fact, when I think about us revisiting our retirement income research later this year, um, 
when we did the research in 2021, we came out with this um, statistic that the media kind of took and ran with that people would be wise to start with a 3.3% initial withdrawal if they're mm-hmm. using kind of that fixed real withdrawal system. I anticipate that because of higher yields providing more of a helping hand, that when we revisit mm-hmm. that research this year, the number will be higher because um, bonds will deliver higher income over uh, over the next it's, 10 years. It's somewhat encouraging because one of the one of the uh, the downsides of uh, funding a flooring portfolio with you know the rest of the portfolio is in in very low interest rates it takes a, a massive portion of your portfolio to fund a floor and a lot of people approaching retirement don't want to spend 80 percent of their portfolio funding a flooring mechanism have you found similar concerns there and, and what what have you found as a useful uh is solution yeah so concerns? Devin, there are you talking about annuities for example it could be annuities it could be other you know bond ladders or you know other types of fixed income products and so forth um, but with interest rates so low, sometimes people have to spend a, a, a dramatic part of their portfolio, and there's some resistance to that, uh, you know, funding that floor with uh, more of a fixed income type approach. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly been a headwind given how low yields have been. My hope is, though, that as higher yields come online, um, that that will become less of a headwind. And could you also talk about, I know you wrote uh, an article maybe two years ago now with Morningstar around the individual bonds versus the bond funds, right? Because it's one that I've like, you know, I was glad that you did it because I've had this, like, I've had that conversation so many times, but I've sent that people that one article a bunch of times now. But um, so how do you frame up that conversation, right? Should I be in a bond fund? Should I have individual bonds? What are the risks and benefits of both? And I know uh, Michael Kitsis doesn't always agree with some of it either too. So I think he disagrees and agrees with some of our points. <laughs> So I am on team bond fund and I have to sort of step back and, you know, wonder, well, I spent a lot of my career in the context of a fund researcher. I like funds. Mm -hmm. I think they're convenient. Uh, But I do think that by the time someone builds an adequately diversified portfolio of individual bonds, they end up with something that looks like a bond, fund, but it's a heck of a lot more complicated to manage. And I know sometimes advisors like to recommend individual bonds, but I can't, can't help but think whether there's just sort of this uh, leftover assumption that it's sort of fancy to have individual bonds in a portfolio. I think funds, uh, you know, assuming that you can find a low expense bond fund are a tremendous bargain. And there's this weird convention in the fund industry that bond funds are cheaper than equity funds always um, or almost always. And so I think it's another sort of area where investors can economize because they're they're getting a lot I think for a fairly low expense ratio, assuming that they opt for a low expense ratio fund. And by the way, I think they should do that. Um, I've been hearing more about, yes, just own individual bonds in this environment uh, because bonds, you know, will protect you against principal losses in a rising rate environment. But again, I think that that challenge for bond fund holders is largely solved by having an appropriate time horizon. Mm -hmm. Don't own an intermediate term bond if you don't have a, an intermediate term time horizon. If your time horizon is two years, be in cash for spending rather than planning to hold something that is just too risky in terms of its interest rate sensitivity. Yeah, I think that was one of the major takeaways because the, the the strongest argument I still hear is that time matching, right? That right. like, well, the bond fund could be down and therefore you're drawing from it during a downtime period versus letting it mature and getting the bond cash flow. Now, arguably, right, the they're still worth similar based off interest rates, but the cash flow becomes a question there. But it also, if I remember, that most bond funds were covered fairly quickly in your research. I don't remember the exact time horizon, but they weren't down as long as I would have thought they would be down for. That's right. Um, So I did examine rolling time periods. The tricky part is that our database and really any database that I know of especially for short-term bonds, doesn't fully capture sort of the late 60s, early 70s period. 
And uh, we do have data from our Ibbotson team that goes back covering intermediate term bonds into the, you know, way beyond the 60s and 70s. But for short term bonds, we don't have the data. But generally, you're right. The data support that if someone has, say, a three year time horizon for a short term bond fund, they will be whole in the vast majority of those periods, even encompassing periods when we've seen rising rates like we're living through right now. And I know Morningstar's done a lot of uh, work on analyzing, you know, the, the differences between active funds and passive funds. And in fixed income in particular, there might be some offer. It's n not unusual to hear this coming from PIMCO, <laughs> right. but I, I'm just interested in hearing your take on, you know, in the fixed income world, uh, you know, the, the opportunity set within passive and active management and maybe approaching some type of environment where one may be preferable over the other. Yeah. So we do have a team that um, I believe quarterly or twice a year does this active passive barometer where they're examining trends between active and passive investment products. Um, and it tends to slip around a little bit. I mean, there are categories like large cap equity go index, please, because right. our data show that uh, active funds have a really poor time uh, beating their passive benchmarks or passive index funds. Um, with bond funds, I think arguably there is an opportunity to for active managers to add a little bit of value in an uncertain environment provided, you know, and, and again, that's one thing we find when we look at the research on active versus passive expenses are really important. You know, I think about the Jack Bogle comment that it's not the efficient markets hypothesis, it's the cost matter hypothesis. And that's especially true for a low returning asset class like like fixed income. The, the debate is always more complicated than what you see in the headlines and especially, you know, fees and, and opportunities to add values in certain areas. It's a, it's, it's a, there, there are much more, many more variables to that conversation and, and the cyclical nature of uh, outperformance in some areas is also something that's uh, kind of difficult to, to get, a, get your head around. Yeah, we've seen, you know, I, I think people need to think about why we have seen the bond indexes, the, you know, the Bloomberg Barclays aggregate get hit so hard. The reason is that because it's so high quality, because it's so focused on U.S. government bonds, it's kind of a pure expression of interest rate risk. And so in an environment like this, uh, the the government bonds that dominate its portfolio will tend to be hit harder than other parts of the bond market. On the other hand, when we look at categories or look at fixed income types that have been good at equity ballast historically the index looks really good from that standpoint because of its heavy complement of government bonds well i'll just go ahead and close this out here then with a final question which is this has been a fantastic conversation but um we're trying to ask everybody in this well um uh, my last question then devin will close out with one what would you christine benz's financially free retirement look like you know, I have um, been thinking a lot about this, uh, especially as I've getting been getting older. Um, but you know, that I I guess I just think about my husband and I as having been really lucky in terms of you know being employed for our whole careers that we, you know, are at the point where we're you know actually sort of financially free, and so you know I guess sort of the work optional. Uh, life stage, yeah. which is incredibly um, wonderful and gratifying. So, you know, I, I think of Carl Richards uh, making a comment to me that he uh, keeps this stop doing list. Mm -hmm. I think he said he got it from got the idea from someone else, but he just on an ongoing basis makes the stop doing list. And he said, so at the end of my career, I hope to <laughs> have stopped doing all those things and be doing things that I find bring me gratification. And so I'm kind of at that mode where hmm. I'm just sort of sorting, uh, very happy to feel like I'm being helpful in my work or at least hope that I'm being helpful. And, um, you know, but I am sort of in this mode where I've got got my stop doing pile of things <laughs> and I won't say what they are, but things that I want to do. <laughs> And things yeah. that I want to do more of. Yeah. I love how that's framed. Stop. <laughs> right. Stop doing things. It thinks, makes your brain think of it in a little bit different way. And, and the last question would be really more of a legacy question. I mean, you, I think you've had an extreme impact on the industry, educating advisors and clients on you know some of these uh, these different strategies out there. What 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 would your what, what do you want your story to be? Well, you know, you know I. Um, 
I, I always joke that I was raised by hippies, which I was a little bit, um, not generationally, but they were. And so it's always been hugely important for me to feel like I'm being helpful, you know, that I'm doing something somewhat altruistic, no matter what I would, what sort of thing I was working on. So I guess that's um, something that I hope people, when they think about me, that like she tried to be helpful, I, you know, uh, have just felt really lucky to be in a position where I can have kind of education as a key thing. I'm not having to sell anything. Um, and that's a really fortunate position to be in. So I guess when I think about my legacy, I hope people will say she helped me. She helped provide me peace of mind. That would be great. That's a great story. Well, you helped us here today. So at least, you know, one thing today that hopefully you don't stop doing is continuing to educate people. But uh, Christine Benz, thank you so much for joining Devin and I here on the show. And, you know, again, continue to educate everybody else out there, especially on retirement income planning, which is, uh, you know, that decumulation phase is so challenging for so many Americans. So your research and education has a huge impact. And thank you, everybody else, for watching and listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. Please listen to this quick disclosure. Investment products contain risk and may lose value. There is no guarantee that an investment product will be successful in achieving its objectives. Investors should consult their investment professional prior to making an investment decision. This podcast is brought to you by Carson Group and PIMCO, who are unaffiliated entities. This material contains the opinions of the speakers and is not necessarily the views of Carson Group or PIMCO, and such opinions are subject to change without notice. This podcast may include discussions of investment strategies. These discussions are for illustrative purposes only and may not be appropriate for all investors. The discussions are not based on any particularized financial situation or need and are not intended to be and should not be construed as a forecast, research, investment advice, or recommendation for any specific PIMCO or other strategy, product, or service. Individuals should consult their own financial advisors to determine the most appropriate allocations for their financial situation, including their investment objectives, time frame, risk tolerance, savings, and other investments. PIMCO does not provide legal or tax advice. Further, This seminar is not intended to provide specific legal, tax, or other professional advice in this podcast. For a comprehensive review of your personal situation, always consult with a tax or legal advisor. The discussion herein is general in nature and is provided for informational purposes only. There is no guarantee as to its accuracy or completeness. Any tax statements contained herein are not intended or written to be used and cannot be relied upon or used for purpose of avoiding penalties imposed by the Internal Revenue Service or state and local tax authorities. Individuals should consult their own legal and tax counsel as to matters discussed herein and before entering into any estate planning, trust, investment, retirement, or insurance arrangement.